Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Selena and I'm a part of the Let's Discuss A Course in Miracles team at the Foundation for Inner Peace. We are holding these Let's Discuss online webinars as an expression of our vision of extending love through the teachings of A Course in Miracles. Our staff support team, Deborah and Emmanuel, are moderating the live chat and Audrey is in the background helping to run the show. Our webinar today is called Reflections and Stories, a tribute to Dr. Kenneth Wapnick. I now invite you to join me in prayer from workbook lesson 189. Simply do this, be still and lay aside all thoughts of what you are and what God is, all concepts you have learned about the world all images you hold about yourself. Empty your mind of everything it thinks is either true or false or good or bad of every thought it judges worthy and all the ideas of which it is ashamed. Hold on to nothing. Do not bring with you one thought the past has taught nor one belief you ever learned before from anything. Forget this world. Forget this course and come with holy, empty hands unto your God. Now, it is my honor to introduce our host today, beginning with Diane Brooke Gusick. Diane Brooke Gusick was born in Brooklyn, New York. Previous to the course, she was a high school English teacher, an astrologer, and a numerologist. In 1979, she became a student of A Course in Miracles. She has lectured extensively and is the author of tapes on course, on course topics. Diane studied with Dr. Kenneth Wapnick, who became her friend, teacher, mentor, and guide. Currently, she works with the Foundation for Inner Peace on the translation program. Judith Scutch Whitson is co-founder and chairwoman of the Foundation for Inner Peace. She was serving on the faculty of New York University when she was introduced to Drs. Helen Shookman and William Thetford, co-scribes of A Course in Miracles. They entrusted her with its manuscript and the role of publisher of the course. She has been a student of the course for 45 years. Welcome, Judy and Diane. Thank you so much, Selena. There you go. Your video's on. Okay. Hi, everyone. Let me invite you to join us today in honoring Ken Wapnick. We were aware that there would not be nearly enough time to answer any questions. That might come later. However, one thing did emerge that people had written in over time, and that's the one that I would like to address right now. Why are there two separate organizations? Although we began with a single foundational entity. In 1975, when it became clear to us that A Course in Miracles must be published, we were given specific instructions in writing from its author, which Helen called the voice, that it was to be published, not commercially, but by a not-for-profit organization. We were told that only those who were committed to this role and nothing else the rest of their lives would perform these tasks. So you can say from the beginning, we knew this was a sacred trust. On the board of directors of the new foundation for inner peace, named by the source itself, was Dr. Kenneth Wapnick, Bob Scutch, and I. Helen and Bill were our constant advisors. The written instructions was the function of the foundation for inner peace to publish, and it said to publish, distribute, and discuss A Course in Miracles, clear and simple. As we continue to ask for guidance explaining along the way these roles, it soon became clear that it was 
Ken's appointed role as the first teacher of the course. As time went by and Bill moved with us to California, Helen died, Ken's teaching role was already well established. For easier functioning, it became expedient for Ken and Gloria to run the Roscoe Teaching Center and all activities related to Ken's work directly in a teaching and new and separate organization licensed by the state of New York as an educational institution. Did we say close? Of course we did. Both foundations worked as one throughout our translation program for many, many years. Ken as the teacher of the translators and final arbiter of the readiness to publish. And my husband, William Whitsitt, as manager for the foundation wrote a piece of the entire program. As of now, we have 27 books in translation and more coming. Until the date of Ken's completion of the stream, he was still an executive board member of the Foundation for Inner Peace. Today, the two organizations with totally separate functions are still joined through the respect and love for Ken. I now give you Diane in person to start our presentation, part of which, as you know, already has been recorded, but this part certainly is not. So over to you, Diane. Uh, the host has stopped my video. Um... It's okay. There you go. Okay. Can you see me? You are good to go, Diane. We can see and hear you perfectly. Okay, great. <laughs> Kenneth Wapnick in 10 minutes. Ken was born in 1942 in Brooklyn, New York, to Jewish parents. It wasn't a religious household. It wasn't a spiritual household, but they were culturally Jewish. Ken went to a yeshiva for the first eight years of his education, after which he was delighted to get into a public high school. In his junior year, he discovered Freud and decided to become a psychologist. At that time, he also made a major discovery. He was introduced to classical music, probably Beethoven more than any of the others. But when he stepped into the realm of listening to music, and he did it throughout his life, it was his first foray into an inner experience that he had never felt within the seeming physical world. He continued his life. At the age of 26, he had his PhD. He married, he had a child, and he also had great conflict because this inner world, which seemed both to need to be protected and which he wanted to live in, that world had nothing to do with anything else in his life. At a certain point, he left his wife, he left his child, he left his job. It was a difficult time for him. And shortly after that, he had an inner experience in which everything opens up for him. And he felt unmistakably that God was a presence in his life and that God was leading him. At that point, he began to live rather monastically. What he really wanted was to devote every moment to God and following God's voice. He also continued to work as a psychologist. He was upstate New York at that time. 
he started to read the Trappist monk Thomas Merton's writing. And he thought it would be nice to spend some time where Merton had lived. So he made an appointment to visit the Abbey of Gethsemane for five days. And in preparation for that, he started going to morning mass. He wasn't interested in the church or any of its traditions. He just thought this would be good preparation. During the mass, he experienced once again that beautiful awakening of that presence within. This was compounded when he went to the monastery, so much so that he decided he was going to become a Trappist monk. And he went back to New York and took vows to become um, a Catholic. He was actually baptized as a Catholic. Now, after you're baptized and before you can become a monk, there's a waiting period of a year in which he thought he would visit Israel. Just before he left for Israel, and if I'm talking quickly, it's because there's a lot to say, but just before he left for Israel, a friend of his introduced him to the co-scribes of A Course in Miracles, Dr. William Thetford and Dr. Helen Chapman, and they mentioned their manuscript. He didn't look at it then because he was just about to leave. He spent about five months in Israel. It was a time of enormous integration of what had come before and what he was about to commit himself to do. He primarily stayed at two abbeys in Israel. The first abbey thought this was very nice, maybe he would move here. And the second abbey, he rather decided, although he was open to asking God, he rather decided that this would be where he would become a monk and live for the rest of his life. He thought it'd be a good idea to go home and kind of tie up loose ends, explain to his parents what this nice Jewish boy was now doing with his life. And he had a lot of people to see. He had friends, he had former clients, he had colleagues. And leaving Israel, he stopped in Europe to see some friends of his. He was busy almost lunches, dinners. He was very, very busy. He was no longer on a monastic schedule. And he was aware to his surprise that he didn't need to be living in a monastery, either as a monk or not. He didn't need a monastic schedule to continue to stay in touch with that voice for God. Still, he uh, wanted to tie up loose ends at the Abbey of Gethsemane and explain to them why he thought he was going to become a monk in Israel. At the Abbey one evening, he was out on the lawn. Nobody else seemed to be around. There were two chairs facing each other. He was sitting in one, and he became aware of a presence of a person in the other chair, and that person was Jesus. It was not for Ken a symbol. It was the person of Jesus, and he said he realized that a real person was living within him, a sweetness that always guided him. And I would just like to take a moment. He started off as a physical child and young man, trying to make sense of the physical sense world. And then he became a young man, a physical young man, and he related to the spiritual God. And now he was having an experience where this physical young man yearning for the spiritual realized that there was a spiritual entity living within him. Ken was 31 when this experience happened. He lived for another 40 years. So this experience, this relationship with Jesus went on for 40 years and of itself developed and as Ken understood its development, he further understood his relationship to Jesus and that he shared with his students. He reconnected on that trip with Helen and Bill. 
and they showed him their manuscript. The first two sections that they gave him were, for they have come and choose once again. Ken could scarcely believe the beauty of the language, the poetry, the total integration of psychology and the spirituality he yearned for. It did not take him long to realize that this was to be his life's work. The first year of the course, he spent almost every day with Helen going over the course with Jesus word for word. The first couple of years, he sat almost daily with Bill and Helen and Judy, and they read the course. They thought about the course. They integrated the course, and they made the course a part of their life. In 1981, he married Gloria, and in 1983, they started their teaching foundation. Ken was prolific. He wrote over 30 books relating to the course. He tape albumed over a hundred topics and themes from the course. He mentored 25 of the translators. What Ken brought to this work, although he didn't talk about it, he was a scholar, he was a psychologist, a philosopher, he knew theology, he knew music, he knew current events, he knew world history, and he knew some of the sciences. I think the thing that most of us, certainly the thing that I remember most about Ken, was every time anyone saw him, he gave you back your innocence. He was a psychologist. He knew what you needed in that moment so that at any conference, there could be hundreds of people at a conference, he managed to say hello, to hug, to tease, to give advice, to be totally present and loving with every one of us. One of the things that the Course says is that Jesus is the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, the symbol, is the embodiment of the memory of God's love. I felt that Ken was the embodiment of the memory of God's love. Helen wrote a poem. She wrote it for Jesus, but I think of it in terms of Ken as well. One of the lines is, a child, a man, and then a spirit. A child, a man, and then a spirit. Hello, everyone. I'm Judy Scutch Whitson, and Diane Gusick and I are going to talk today about one of our favorite subjects. His name is Dr. Kenneth Wapnick, and we both love him dearly. But first, I want to tell you why Diane Gusick and I are doing this together. Not too many years ago, about seven, I would say, right after Ken Wapnick died, in fact, I got a call from Diane, who had moved from Seattle, the area of Seattle, to, to Tiburon, California, where I was living, very close by, five minutes away. And she told me who she was. We had a brief chat. And all of a sudden, I felt very clearly, I need to see this woman. And I asked if she could come over. And she did. And the very first time we spent together, we started to talk. And about seven hours later, my husband asked me, what's for dinner? <laughs> <laughs> and it's been that way ever since. I deeply believe in the larger scheme of things that Ken had a great deal in bringing us together. In fact, as you will hear our story, I think you might feel the same way. So how did it all start for me? 
It all started for me in 1975 when I met Helen Shuckman, Bill Thetford, and Ken Wapnick. Now, at that time, I had been teaching at New York University, and it was a course in consciousness research. And Bill Thetford had heard me speak a few times, and somehow or other, he felt very strongly that I was to be part of their group. He felt that I would know what the next step was. And so he invited me to come and meet him and Helen for lunch at the faculty club at Columbia University, New York City, Physicians and Surgeons. And while there, we had a conversation that seemed to be just cursory. I didn't feel any real connection or it wasn't going place. And suddenly I said to them, looking at Helen, you're hearing an inner voice, aren't you? Which astounded me and astounded her even more. <laughs> but Bill just started to laugh. He had a great sense of humor. And he said, I think it's time we go up to our office and talk in private. And so we went up to their office in the building that's called the Black Building in New York City on 165th Street. And there I met Kenneth Wapnick. Uh, he hadn't joined us for lunch because I guess that was just their decision, but there he was sitting and I met him. Um, I must say it was a very quiet meeting. Uh, Bill and Helen proceeded to lock their door and pull down the shade so they would have total privacy. And he and Helen told me the story of the manuscript that they had scribed and how it all happened. That first day, which lasted about two or three hours with the story and then questions, Ken spoke very little. In fact, I'm not even sure that he said more than a few sentences, but my impression of him was very shy, very quiet guy. Uh, he had a noticeable stutter and um, he was mostly just listening to all of this and observing. So that my primary relationship that very first day was with Helen and Bill as I heard the story of A Course in Miracles. Well, there was no question in my mind that I had been waiting for this all my life. And in a sense, it was the map home that I had prayed for and asked for as recently as a week before when I felt I was in desperate need of help. And as the days went by and Helen and Ken and Bill came to my apartment in New York City every day after work, which was about one o'clock in the afternoon, and we spent time together basically talking about the course, me learning the course, them teaching me the course, um, it became very evident that we were going to have to do something more with it that other people really were going to be using this. And they allowed me to tell my class at New York University a bit about it. And almost everyone wanted a copy. So it started that way. We really didn't know anything about publishing. I didn't feel that was my role because I wasn't a publisher. And uh, certainly Ken and Bill didn't feel it was their role. Certainly Helen felt that she didn't want it published at all. And Ken would usually support Helen in almost everything she felt, unless, unless it was a question of something that we were to do together, a person we were to see together, in which case it was very clear that we were to ask together. Our process of working together for three years, five days a week was to study and to ask. And as it became evident that we were supposed to publish the course, and it became even more evident that there was no one else to do it because we had to, as a sacred trust, care for it very carefully and make sure that nothing was changed as far as a publisher printing it differently or putting a picture on the cover, who knew what. We interviewed quite a few people and it came very clear that we were supposed to do it ourselves. 
And how did that become clear? Because we asked. And I remember very, very distinctly, as we closed our eyes, a question was, is this course supposed to be published? We all got a resounding yes. And then when is it supposed to be published? Each of us got somewhat the same terminology immediately, right away, don't wait. <laughs> but we all did this equally. And then we wanted to know, well, who is supposed to publish it? And the answer we got was only those who work with this and do this and nothing but this the rest of their lives. I look back now and I think, what a commitment it was for us to say, yes, we would. But then again, once we had the course, where else were we going to go? I remember very clearly that every time Ken talked about the course, or we read out loud with each other to each other, he never stuttered. His stammer disappeared when he was talking about the course. If he was conversing naturally about where we were to go for dinner together, if we were going out, or what time he needed to take Helen home, because Ken was really Helen's, I'll call her, called him her chaperone, but what he was is really her caregiver. But otherwise, Ken would not have freedom of articulate speech. And I didn't think about it then much at all, but as we went along through the years, it became clear to me that he was overcoming this situation the more he spoke about it until eventually he started to speak in public about it. And that came about because as people started to read and study the course, they wanted to know more about it. And both Ken and I would go out at different times and once together to tell people the story of the course and of course the basic theology. Ken would talk very, very simply, very clearly, very quietly, but afterwards when people asked him questions, I could tell he was very nervous because of his stammer and therefore he was quite shy. I found Ken to be a very private person. Although Helen and Bill were quite open about their feelings, Ken was more a supporter. He was there in quiet. Ken would always suggest it's time to pray on this. Whenever Helen and Bill got into uh, a confrontation, which was very often, Ken would be the one to say, should we stop and pray about this? So we sort of grew into a unit, which I think was part of the plan. Uh, we always thought we were very strange choices to be involved at this level, doing something with a manuscript called The Course of Miracles, which Helen really didn't want to acknowledge, but knew very, very well. We had the opportunity to observe each other grow. Uh, Ken was not married at the time. All through the time that Helen was alive, Ken was not married. He didn't get married until well, very soon after. But the kind of relationship we had together uh, seemed to blend quite well. I don't mean there weren't differences of opinion. Of course there were, and Ken had his too. But every time we sat and we asked, we got the same guidance, we got the same answer. So seeing Ken in those very early days, he was 33 years old when I met him. I was 11 years older, I was 44. Helen was 66 and Bill was 54, if I remember correctly. Um, Helen treated us as a family and she felt in some way, and actually some ways articulated it, that Ken was her son. He arrived first on the scene and I was the daughter. In fact, she asked me to call her mama. Now, at times, when we had some disagreements, Ken would point to Ken, uh, Helen would point to Ken and say to him, 
remember she's your big sister. Or if I was disagreeing with something, she turned to me and she'd say, remember, he's your baby brother. I can't say he liked that very much. <laughs> but, but in her mind, this was a family. And this is how we grew. Now, I'm going to stop at this point because actually Diana comes onto the scene about this time and let her tell you her first impressions of meeting Ken, what she was doing and how she felt. Um, it was in late 1979 that I first started the course and within maybe a week or two, Ken Wapnick was scheduled to give a talk and I decided to go. It's hard to describe how much a presence this shy man who stuttered was. It was clear he was very bright. His presentation was wonderful. But there was a quiet presence in him that I wasn't even aware of, but I knew I was drawn to. It had nothing to do with anything personal. And the day was rainy and Ken had a cold and I did what I usually do. I sit in the front row because I wanted to understand everything um, coming in from a very intellectual place. But at the end of his presentation, I went up to him. This was in Manhattan and he didn't drive a car. He may have been a driver, but he didn't have a car. And I had driven in. So I said, can I drive you home? And this young man in his late 30s stood there right in front of me. I was also in my 30s. He closed his eyes. And then he opened them and he said, yes, you can drive me home. I mean, it was so clear that he stopped and physically asked. I didn't even understand what had happened. Um, but it gave us a chance to connect as people. In the beginning, I saw Ken as a shy, proper man. He would come in with his white shirt or blue shirt and his tie and his jacket. He's not a large man, so he would stand there and he would say these brilliant things, but he wasn't a large presence. Over the years, this very shy, presenter blossomed. When he married Gloria, he took off the jacket and eventually he released the tie, but he was always a proper man, but he also became a stand-up comedian. He had so much fun with this material that he loved that going to learn from him really became, in addition to something profound, it became a weekend or a week or a month of entertainment because he had, not in the beginning, or at least I never noticed it, but he developed such a playful, playful side. Ken was a bachelor when I met him. As far as I know, he had no social life whatsoever. Um, he mixed with people freely and easily as time went along. We had many people coming to our apartment in New York City, which was thankfully quite large and hopefully gracious and could accept many people from all over and all over the world eventually to talk with Helen and Bill. And it was quite clear to me that Ken was becoming more socialized <laughs> uh, that, you know, he was, it was like a, a workplace for him, all of these people to be able to discuss the course freely and in a way get ready for his teaching role because there is a plan. I have no question in my mind. And in God's plan, Ken had a very particular place and I could watch the various processes without thinking about them at the time, but in reflection, remembering them very well. 
And so this bachelor person, who I thought had no social life whatsoever, um, one day after Whit and I had moved to California, actually Bob and I moved to California, and I met Whit and then married him, um, Ken said he was coming to California and he'd like to spend some time with us. And he was bringing his wife. <laughs> wife, I said. <laughs> wife? <laughs> How did this happen? All the time that Ken knew Gloria and they were friends, teacher, student, and then courting, and then a partnership. I had no idea, nor did Helen and nor did Bill, and I would say, nor did Helen, and God forbid. Ken knew absolutely that it would cause a lot of conflict in his relationship with Helen, which was superb. But his relationship with Helen might be damaged and there would be a setback if he, she knew that he was in love and he was going to marry. And so he did not marry until after Helen died. And lo and behold, years later, when I met Diane and we talked about our various experiences, she said, oh, you didn't know that he was gonna get married? I said, not in the slightest idea. She said, I was at his wedding. So maybe you'll talk about that. <laughs> um, Ken was married, to my surprise, in a Catholic church. Gloria was Catholic. I think by then he had been baptized. Um, and I saw a side of him, a personal side of him, that I had never seen before. He moved very quickly. He was a live man, but he moved quickly, and he had instructions for the organist, and he went over to the priest, and he went over to, I think it was his brother. He went over to various people. He was telling them what to do. Um, and I saw... Uh, a man very much in control. I mean, he was still centered, but he knew how he wanted this wedding to take place. Um, this is not straight on a Ken story, but after the church wedding, we went back to his house and he had a reception in the backyard. And it was, I believe the man's name was Father Ben. I saw a priest in a Cossack, and I had never seen a priest in a Cossack. And, and let me just say who Father Ben was to my best recollection. He had been a PhD candidate under Bill and Helen. And he had also read Ken's doctorate thesis, somehow he had read it, um, on mysticism and schizophrenia, and he was very interested in that. And if my memory serves me, Judy, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was Father Ben who introduced Ken to Bill and Helen. And any anyway, rate, I'm looking at this man in a Cossack. We're in the backyard. People are eating and drinking. And I was still young. I was early in the course and impressionable. And I'm looking at Father Ben's back and I'm thinking, oh, he's such a holy man. And Father Ben turned around, looked at me, and said, thank you. So those are my fondest memories of um, Ken's wedding. It was always interesting. I think all of us kept our eyes open wide when Ken first married Gloria. We were curious about the personal man. And he didn't, when he taught, he didn't share a whole lot of the uh, personal man. So who he married and the personality of who he married and how lovingly, how patiently he supported Gloria in her early years. Obviously, she was new to the, she was a student of the course, but in her early years coming in as Ken's wife, she was still also a student and learning. And he supported her in every instance, with love, he would look at her almost with adoration. Now, he certainly wasn't adoring her. He knew who to adore, but that was the way his love supported his bride. It was interesting to watch. 
Yeah, I think that's something that is really wonderful to share, Ken and Gloria's relationship. Ken was Ken before Gloria. Yes. And Gloria, I'm sure, was Gloria before Ken. But together they became Ken and Gloria. Or Gloria and Ken, depending upon whichever name you used first. They were definitely a working couple. Um, their love was extraordinary to see. They, towards the latter years, when I saw them together, I felt they glowed. And I found this out for many other people too. Uh, one of our friends, Andy Wagner, who is a German student of A Course in Miracles, told me that he was out to dinner with two other people in the Ken and Gloria, and Gloria couldn't quite decide what to have for dinner. And she asked Ken, what are you having? And he said, whatever you're having, darling. <laughs> said there was something about that exchange. They didn't see anyone else at the table. Their eyes were just on each other. And they were saying, I love you. So this was a very, very different Ken than Ken was before he married Gloria. Uh, not only did they grow in a marriage together, but they grew in their work. And they fit so perfectly in the roles that they were assigned that uh, I guess people could look at them and say, this is the way a holy relationship might look. They didn't seem to have any grievances against each other. They didn't seem to uh, be sharp with each other. They were always kind. I never once heard them be unkind to each other, as people sometimes are. You know, the ordinary put down between people who know each other very well and are partnered and are married. Uh, nothing like that. It was generosity. Um, Ken was a natural caregiver. And I had known from the time I met him that he was adored by his grandmother, for whom he cared deeply, his mother, who also cared for deeply, and Helen, who we literally hands-on cared for, taking her around hither and yon. There was a time when Ken and Helen were a bit late to our meeting at our apartment. Bill had come without them, and they came in on this hot summer day, very flushed and looking disgruntled. And we said to them, are you okay? What happened? And Ken said, nothing happened. Everything is fine. And Helen said, I needed a pair of green pantyhose. And Ken took me to seven different department stores. And do you know, not one of them had green pantyhose to match my new outfit. And I looked at Ken and he just sort of smiled and he shrugged. And I thought, when your brother asks a foolish thing of you, you do it. That's the kind of love he had for her and the kind of devotion and the kind of care. Helen was very upset when Bill Thetford and we moved to California. That's too long a story to go in here, and it's not a Ken story. But she was very upset, but Ken was there to help her and to take care of her and to be with her. And he and Louie were there the night that she died. And she was quite peaceful and calm. And they went home and within two hours later, they got a call from the hospital that Helen had passed away. Not in front of Mother, they had been sitting and waiting, but on her own. And when they got to the hospital, no one had touched her. And Ken told me, he said, oh, Judy, she had the most beatific smile on her face. Jesus had come for her as he promised. I think that kind of love is very rare indeed. And I think Ken was more or less prepared for this role. Uh, there were similarities between his relationship with Helen, his mother, and his grandmother. They had something in common that he responded to. 
one day, Helen was, of course, very, very dear to Ken and loved him as a son. Hell, Ken's mother was not happy about this. First of all, she didn't know Santa Claus and Miracles at all. She and her husband brought Ken up Jewish and sent him to a yeshiva, which is a Jewish parochial school. And what is he doing with his book by Jesus? So that bothered her enough. And yet he obviously was so attached to Helen. And although he didn't give his mother less attention or less love or kindness, she was really angry. And one day Bill Thetford, who was always full of these amazing intuitive ideas, said to me, you know, I think some night for dinner, we should have Joe and Clarice, Ken's parents, Wapniks, and your mom, Bobby and Sam, come over for dinner with us at the same time. And I said, why? He said, I don't know, it feels right. So I did, and that night, Ken's mother and my mother became best friends. And it was wonderful to watch them. Ken and I were a little perplexed in the beginning. They were very different type of women, but they become so close. They became so close, the two of them, that uh, they would see each other oh, three or four times a week. They went to the knitting store together and Clarice and my mother both liked to make tapestries and uh, they would get patterns and talk about them and they'd go to movies and they weren't close as couples like my father and my mother and Joe and Clarice, but the two women became so close. And one day Clarice told my mother who repeated to me and I repeated to Ken, of course, well, she said, you know, Bobby, my mother's name was Bobby. I really didn't like this whole business with the Course of Miracles. I don't understand it. I don't know what Ken is doing, but I'll tell you something. If it weren't for this course, I wouldn't have you. Very early on, he did, um, he presented, a, I think it was a one day. And of course, Diane Goody Tushins would want to get there early and also get her front row seat. And it was quite a long drive to where he was presenting that day, well over two hours as I remember it. And for whatever the reason, I was driving alone and my car stopped driving. This was on a Saturday morning. I had to call the AAA, I had to be towed. I must have been fairly hysterical. I had not ingested the course yet, so fairly hysterical was normal for me. And I explained to the man how I had to get to this conference and, and I came in probably a good hour or two late and I was embarrassed. And on a break, I went up to Ken and, and probably breathlessly said, I'm so sorry, Ken, I meant to be there on time. You know, I wouldn't mean to be late, but I had car trouble and there was nothing I could do. And he sort of stood back and took me in and then he smiled and he said, come on, Diane, what did you need? I said, what are you talking about? No, you don't understand. My car had a problem. I mean, we could have been scared, Ken. My car, he said to me, who did you meet, Diane? I said, I didn't meet anybody. He said, Diane, who fixed your car? Oh, I, I saw a mechanic fixed it. He said, Diane, did you remember to bless him? Did you see him as a brother? And then he just smiled. That was early, Ken. That was even before his sense of humor was developed. We had, um, we had an interesting relationship. I, I was connected to him as a teacher, in part because I spoke to him honestly. I was connected to him as a therapist, in part because I taught early. There were not a lot of teachers then. He became my mentor, not that he was thrilled in the beginning that I was teaching. He was in the middle and in the end more than. Um, but in the beginning, I think he felt that I knew the words and he wanted them to become richer to me. But in his role as therapist, I was talking to him and I said, I needed to do something. I knew it would hurt a lot of people, um, but I needed to do it. 
And he didn't do a lot of searing. One of the interesting things about Ken the teacher is he always taught bottom line. This is what the course is saying. Bottom line, if it isn't of God, it isn't real. But when he dealt with any of us on a one-to-one, he dealt with us, he met us exactly on the rung of the ladder we were. So he tried to talk me out of this adventure I was planning on going on. And he could see at a certain point that there was no way of talking me out of it. And he looked at me and he tilted his head and he said, okay, Diane, if you do it, I can, will pick up the pieces. Let me know how it goes. Always love, always supportive. Vintage Ken. He also never told me what to teach. When he knew I was going on various conferences, he never told me what to teach. He always, of course, taught non-duality, but he never emphasized it until he felt that there were a lot of people who were misunderstanding it. And then he did a weekend on duality and non-duality. Um, it was one of his more impassioned weekends, at the end of which I really understood intellectually that the world was not real. And I was in absolute terror. And I went up to him afterwards, forgetting I was speaking to a psychologist and how transparent I must have been. And I said to him, I can't teach this, Ken. I can't tell people that the world isn't real. They'll be terrified. And he looked at me and he smiled and then he got very serious because I then commanded a lot of students. And he looked at me with those beautiful eyes and he said, you don't have to tell them, Diane, but you need to know it because it will come out differently. I felt it was very profound. I love these stories. I love them. Diane, it just, it makes me think of so many of those little things that happened that made for the relationship. And when I hear you, of course, in a totally different position of working with them, yes. reflect some of the same feelings that I had. Uh, it feels very whole and in a way very healing. I cannot say that everything amongst us, the four of us, Helen, Bill, Ken, and I, was harmonious. In fact, Helen and Bill were not the least bit harmonious. <laughs> but even Ken and I, we would quietly disagree about a certain way to go. Of course, as I said, we would always ask. But um, I could tell that there wasn't a really close feeling yet because all my attention was on Helen and Bill and very little on Ken. In 1976, Helen wrote as part of what we called her special message series. She wrote that the year was going to end in blazing glory. In 1976, as the end of the year approached, we all thought that Helen and Bill's relationship would be healed. And who knows, it would all evanesce. <laughs> we didn't know it was meant by blazing glory. And we were sitting in my apartment on New Year's Eve of 1976, waiting for blazing glory to strike us all. And of course, nothing happened. And about five minutes of 12, Helen said, well, I'm going home. And what she thought, of course, what she had taken down was incorrect. And just then, and my apartment was on Central Park West in New York City. So all my windows faced the park and we heard music outside and we heard loudspeakers broadcasting the music. And it was Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture. 
And as it came to a crescendo, all of a sudden the whole sky over New York City was lit up with massive firework display. We had not known this was going to happen. I don't believe they ever did it again. But that particular year, and Bill, after the extraordinary display, the breathless display of fireworks that were right in front of us, were over, said, well, I guess that was blazing glory. <laughs> Ken later wrote that he felt that was one of the incidences where Helen's ego got in the way. And somehow or other, I didn't feel that was true. We never discussed this. But as the years went by, and I remember the blazing glory story, because I had a lot of humor in it, I realized that was the year the course was published. It was published in hardcover in 1976, June 22nd. And by the time the year was over, I think 5,000 copies, word of mouth, were distributed from our apartment in New York City. I think now, looking back on it, it wasn't Helen's ego. Jesus always had a good sense of humor. <laughs> I think that was really blazing glory, looking back on it. These things that just come up in a conversation, um, we all have different ways of looking at the people we know and love. And of course, right now, Diane and I, given you our more or less kaleidoscopic view of Ken. There'll be many of you who are listening, watching right now, who have known Ken well over the years and have your own stories. Um, they should be considered included in all of this because no one person is just what one person sees. They have many different parts to them and people react to them in many different ways. Um, it was very, very clear in 1978 when a delightful man came to visit us from Mexico who had been uh, a representative to the UN, had graduated Columbia University, their college, uh, with degrees in diplomacy. And um, he was probably at that time in his mid-50s. And he came to visit Helen and Bill and me and Ken, because he wanted to talk about translating the course into Spanish. He had already started, he had a group. He was always interested in metaphysics and had a group who learned together with him. And then he found the course and he started translating it for his students. And he wanted to be able to have the rights to publish the course. <clears throat> now, Helen really, really liked Emilio Guthman. First of all, he was very handsome. Second of all, he was very courtly. Third of all, he was delighted to meet her and kept kissing her hand and holding her hand. So, well, she was more than flattered and flirted a little with him too. But when he said that he wanted the rights from us, the copyright holders, to publish the course, she said, over my dead body. And he was startled. Actually, we were all startled because she was so emphatic. And he said, why not? She said, the course cannot be translated. It was given in English. If Jesus is author wants to give courses in other languages, I'm sure he will. But this is the one we're given and it is too difficult to translate. The translator must know it so thoroughly first and then work for years and years to make sure that she or he puts it into the correct form, that it can't be done, and I therefore prohibit it. Ken supported Helen completely. Bill and I were sort of neutral, but we asked together, and it was that it should not, we should not give the rights to Emilio Guthman to translate and therefore publish a Course in Miracles in Mexico. Over the years, things changed. Helen died. And other people around the world wrote us that they were publishing the course. Spanish was the first language, by the way, and then German, and that they were already publishing the course and they wanted permission to, I mean, they were already translating the course and they wanted permission 
to publish it. And we always got when we asked absolutely no, until one day we realized that we were not really proactive, but we had to react. And when we sat and asked together, what Ken felt, and he certainly was very strong about it, is we cannot allow anyone to translate and publish this course, but we must do it ourselves. That would be a tremendous undertaking and a very, very intense commitment. Ken would have to be the teacher of the individual translator or sometimes a pair of translators, very seldom more than two, but they were readers and editors and it would be Ken's job to help them understand the course and to train them really until he was sure and we were sure that they really understood. Of course, we didn't speak their languages, but at this then nor did Ken, but at the same time, uh, we felt if the people or the person doing this particular job was called upon to do it and he or she always felt that that's the reason they had to do it, not they wanted to, but they had to, then the best we can do is to help them achieve the goal, but under the guidance of its very first teacher, who of course can. So we started a translation program, which the Foundation for Inner Peace, which we were, uh, would supervise through my husband, Bill Whitson, Wit, as I called him, and Ken, and they became working partners. And over 25 years, these two men of such different backgrounds and quite far apart in years and experience and profession work together to help make these translations available to the world. Why am I telling you this? Because one of the most important stories that I have came out of this. We talk about our tremendous admiration for Ken and obviously you see our love, but he was just like all of us. He could be opinionated, difficult, he could hold grievances, just like any of us, except he was further along <laughs> and he could teach how not to. In this particular case, there was a tremendous difference of opinion between Whit, my husband, who was manager of the program, and Ken on how it should be taught. And it got to be very uncomfortable until I really felt over time there was going to be a split. And in prayer, I knew this was not to happen. Ken at that time was living in New York, had his center at Temecula um, and a very excellent place of teaching and learning it was. And Whit and I were living right near Bill Thetford in California. And we had established already that we were two different organizations so that one could be strictly for teaching with Ken and Gloria heading it and the other could be the Foundation for Inner Peace, which was strictly publishing, distributing. And that would be Bob Scutch, my other husband, who was with me when I got the course and later became Wits and my dear partner that we still work with today. It was very unsettling to all of us that this tremendous conflict was happening. And Witt and I decided through guidance that we should go to New York and be with Ken in person and see how we could work this out. Witt and I checked into a hotel in New York and Ken was going to come over the next morning at nine o'clock and we were going to spend the day together going through this. And I could see my husband getting more and more and more upset as the evening went through. He didn't think it was gonna work out. There didn't seem to be any place that they could meet. And finally, when we went to sleep at night, I dared suggest to him, 
before we go to bed, may we pray on this? And he said, oh, of course. I know that I prayed that we should all see it differently and be in harmony with God's plan again. When I got up, my husband was so peaceful. He said, it went away. I said, what went away? He said, any resistance, any fear, any conflict, it's gone. Oh, thank God, I thought to myself. The doorbell rang. It was Ken coming into our hotel room to discuss this. And I was terrified. And I saw Whit open the door, and Ken's face was not his usual face of calm and peace. I could see he was tight, his jaw was tight. And my husband just opened his arms and embraced Ken. And Ken, and he rocked back and forth and back and forth for a few moments, just holding themselves heart to heart. And the conflict was over. Over. So I witnessed two men I love very much going through their own dark night of the soul with a particular situation that was really important. And they resolved it, but not by talking about it. I don't think the whole afternoon or morning we talked about it. We just had fun. But it was indeed over and the translations could progress. I get very emotional when I talk about this because it's a course in action. And many people perhaps don't know that Ken, who was a superb teacher and the first teacher, himself went through his learning process of how to let go of grievances. Whit and Ken had held a grievance for quite a while against each other over this translation program. It was gone in a second and neither of them ever forgot that. I'm wondering, Diane, whether you have any memories like that. Um, not so much of the healing, but of the playfulness, the delightful playfulness of his teaching. Very early on, um, he did a one-day workshop, and there was a man who came who had never come before, and Ken was saying that any important relationship that you have in your life will give you an opportunity for healing. And the man raised his hand, and he was rather agitated. He was a well-spoken man, but he was agitated, and he said, what are you saying? I've been married to my wife for a long time, X number of years, and she's lovely, and she is never going to give me an opportunity to forgive her. I adore her, and I really don't understand what you're trying to say. And Ken looked at him, and he smiled, and he said, oh, you poor dear. And he paused, and we took it in. When we first moved, our first move out of New York, my husband and I, um, when we first moved outside of Seattle, there was enormous culture shock. And Ken had said, let me know how the move goes. And so I wrote and I said, Ken, the women here all chirp. If they don't chirp, they sing. This is not comfortable for me. He wrote back almost immediately, dear Diane, my favorite chirper. <laughs> Um, Ken was serious about this material. Again, I think it's really important to say that the professional Ken, the teacher, taught at a very bottom line level, but he met us where we were. But he also wanted us to absorb experientially, which is what the course asks of us. He wanted us to absorb what he was saying and what he was saying was contrary to everything the world was teaching us. One night after a particularly long day of teaching, a group of us was sitting around in the teaching rooms. It was a large group of us. And a young woman who was a participant 
took out a guitar and started playing. Ken walked in, and Ken was a polite man. There was not an unkind bone in him. He, he knew what he wanted, but there was no unkindness in him. And his face had almost a pained look, and he said, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to ask you, to, he said to the young woman playing the guitar, I'm going to have to ask you to stop playing. This is an academy where we think about what's going on in our mind and we remember which teacher we're listening to. That's a hard thing to integrate. And that's what I want you to do. He didn't, he didn't use all those words. He wanted us not to be distracted from the teaching. And I think that that was very vintage kin. He was a teacher by playfulness. There was one man who relayed uh, the story of he felt very much like garbage. So when Ken saw him, he picked him. Ken was a small man. This was a big guy. He picked this big guy up and dropped him in the garbage can. <laughs> um, he was playful. He knew our, he, he had something going with the hundreds of us that were students. He had something going with each of us, which means he had taken the time to hear our story to understand our belief system and to remind us that we could go further. One of the favorite things that he said to me, and I know Judy, you told me that he has said this to you as well. Very often after a conversation with him, he would look at me and say, go deeper. He wanted you to hear his theory he wanted you to build your own inner relationship whereby you let go, if only briefly, your ego's investment that you might rest in that outer spacious place of love. And he didn't teach you how to get there. He said, go deeper. So. I just want to go back to my first memory of Ken as teacher. As I told you, we would sit in our apartment in New York City five days a week and study, read aloud, teach, discuss the course and what was to happen with it, of course. And one day, Helen and Bill were having a tremendous argument and Ken decided he and I should leave the room and let them at it. <laughs> so we left them sitting in the living room and we went to sit in our library. And this was the first time I had ever been alone with Ken. We were always together or Bill stayed in our house for dinner almost every night. Uh, I had been alone with Helen, but I had never spent time alone with Ken. And we were just looking at each other, smiling and not too comfortable about what was going on in the other room. And he said to me, don't worry about it. He said, you know, they'll work it out and then we'll go back in. And he said, they're not quite ready for forgiveness. And I immediately thought, of course, of myself. And I said, Ken, do I have to see every person against whom I hold a grievance or a grudge and see them in order to forgive them. It was obviously, I didn't quite yet understand what forgiveness meant. Instead of telling me that and correcting me, Ken said, no, dear, you only have to want to. In those few words, I understood the power of intent. And it never left me. You only have to want to. The Course says show the slightest willingness. You only have to want to. You don't have to be face to face with your dead uncle <laughs> to let go of the grievances you may have had against him. All you have to do is recognize it never happened. All you have to do is shift into the belief system of non-duality 
and recognize you can forgive everybody, everything, the way you can forgive a dream that you have when you awaken. It never really happened. In this world, of course, it seems very real indeed. And this is where we're doing our work. And we have no idea in time what that means. We just know it's how much we want to. The more we want to, the stronger our intent is, the more the higher self, the Holy Spirit, the voice for God, Jesus helps us. All we have to do is invite him. I am ready to go deeper. I want to go deeper. Help me go deeper. And I learned that just in one sentence from him. It's as if it got transferred from his knowing to my receptivity, but it would take a long time until I totally understood it. I think that's the mark of a great teacher, that he or she can say things to you exactly where you are that will help you understand. But as you grow and as you go deeper, it becomes more and more apparent, the meaning. I was blessed, lucky enough, who knows why, to have three teachers in my life. I didn't realize at the time that Ken was also my teacher. He was my baby brother. But he would come out with things like that that stayed with me for a very long time. I always saw Ken and Bill as our teacher. We learned the course with them. Why should we have a different interpretation of it? It would be highly unlikely. We might have different ways of practicing. We may have different ways of learning. Our personalities were certainly very different. But we had the two people who were scribes, one of whom actually asked for another way, and the other one who said, I'll join you and help you find it. Teach us every day. I, I still... At my age now, and I'm nearing 90, I still cannot get over the wonder of that, the blessedness or the perfection. Uh, I would love to do one teaching story about Ken right before he died um, and, and a, a PS on why I think Ken was such a great caretaker, as you put it, with difficult women, with Helen with his mother, with even with Gloria, Ken always told us, and I think he lived it and knew it, that a holy relationship wasn't between two people. It was between the individual and his inner connection. Whether you understood that as Jesus or the Holy Spirit or stepping back past your ego. And I think, I know, I know that Ken had a holy relationship that he perfected. It's He always had a place for the not tangible. At first it was music, and then it became the course, but it was his bond with that inner teacher. He reminded all of us often that we are not here. And so when Ken was dying, and he knew he was dying, and his staff knew he was dying, occasionally when he was well enough, he would come into the office. And this is a story that was relayed to me. He said to the staff who, looked, I mean, he must have looked very different when he was dying. Why do you look so sad? I'm not going anyplace. I'm not even here always the teacher to the end, a, a gentle reminder, and neither are you. Why do you look so sad? I'm not even here. But my presence and that oneness that I'm aligned with, and now I'm putting words on Ken, that can be always with you if you're willing. He was a very wonderful friend and teacher. I'm so grateful, so grateful, so grateful for that assignment. 
wonderful little memories like that come back. I have a feeling we can go on forever, but we're not going to. So uh, I think that um, on behalf of the way that Diane and I both feel about how Ken was in relationship to each of us, that I can say from my heart that I witnessed from a shy, stammering, quiet, immaculate, and thoughtful student of A Course in Miracles to a dedicated, strong, caring, articulate, humorous, and brilliant teacher of God. Thank you, Ken, for your life's work, which you have left us in perpetuity. All of us, we say thank you. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Judy and Diane. Thank you all for joining us today. We so appreciate you being here for this marvelous gathering honoring Dr. Kenneth Wapnick. For those of you who are on social media, please note our social media links in the chat, including our Facebook group called Let's Discuss A Course in Miracles. We appreciate all of your generous donations and contributions to the Foundation for Inner Peace, and we honor your presence here. Our next Let's Discuss ACIM webinar is to be announced for March. Thanks a lot, everyone, and take care. <laughs>